Let me just say this. Uh, the brother that is our guest speaker tonight is no stranger to us. Omali Yeshitela has been in the struggle for African liberation at home and abroad all of his life. Correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he is a former member of the Black Panther Party. Is that correct? Wrong. Wrong? <laughs> kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. <laughs> He's a soldier in the Black Liberation Movement, but he is the founder of the African People's Socialist Party and the founder of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement. International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement in PEDEM. And he has been a strong supporter of the People's Organization for Progress. We are part of a coalition that uh, he has formed called the Black is Back Coalition and we've uh, been participating in that for several years now. And um, I just have the utmost respect for Omali Ashatella, his organization, what he has built. I have been to Florida, St. Petersburg where his compound is. And I've also been to Philadelphia where they have other uh, institutions. And um, the Impedum Conference is this weekend. Uh, it's uh, Saturday and Sunday, starting at 9 a.m. It's going to be at the Refall headquarters. And also, Brother Yeshitela is calling a national march on Washington, D.C. Uh, in November. So he is here to talk about those things, but I also want him to talk about Ferguson and African resistance at home and abroad. I'm sure you could work it in there. So let's give the utmost welcome to Brother Omali Yeshatella. Give him a big hand. Come on now. Let's welcome that brother. Give him a big hand. Give him a big hand now. Come on. Come on, POP. Give him a big hand. Take your time. Uhuru. Uhuru. First of all, I'd like to offer my most profound appreciation to Chairman Lawrence Han and uh, to you of the People's Organization Progress for Progress. And also, I'd like to uh, express my condolence and support uh, for the families of these murdered young men. Um, I think it takes real serious courage to come out uh, to this meeting to do what it is that you were doing because despite any of the other reasons that you kill, they kill your sons and grandsons and, and your brother, one reason they did it and the way they did it was to instill fear in our community to paralyze you, uh, to make you uh, feel powerless in the face of what they assume to be their strength and their power and their ability to kill us with impunity. So I just want to express my appreciation to you. And, uh, and I'm also extremely pleased that you have a place to come uh, to deal with this question, these issues. Right now, uh, we're involved in a case in Orlando, Florida, Disney, Disneyland, where a 22-year-old young Tavon Grayson is in a jail infirmary after being shot eight times, once in the head, uh, by the Orlando Police Department in July. Circumstances sound so much like what it is you've just described. And at least one witness say that after they shot him, he did run into a couple of cars. They dragged him out of the car and then shot him again. So this is not unusual. 
You don't need to sell me on the issue of whether he was involved in criminal activity or anything like that. Because the crime was the one that was committed against him and your family. Because even if they want to suggest that stealing a car is illegal and a crime, it is not a crime punishable by execution. It is not a crime punishable by execution. But your, your brother is dead. And he's dead just like Mike Brown is dead in Ferguson. Uh, and he's dead just like a uh, uh, young brother uh, out of Florida who was killed 18 years old, Tyron Lewis, shot three times in broad daylight in a car that they said bump them, bump the police when they tried to stop the car. Mm. Dead. And like so many others, Abdul, dead. So something is going on here. And I think that we have to recognize that and stop being apologetic when it is we who are the victims of murder, yes. state-sanctioned murder. Yes. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I was here about five years ago. And uh, it may be because I'm a glutton for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> But five years ago, I came here for the same reason that I'm here today. And I came here with the Black is Back Coalition for social justice, peace, and reparation. And it was just organized uh, in 2009. And it was organized in the heat of the Bush regime and then following that, the continuation of the wars that were being initiated against people all around, especially in the Middle East. But we pulled together the Black is Back Coalition, not just because of the wars that were happening in those places. We pulled it together because the traditional anti-war movement, the traditional peace movement, did not have the ability to look at the wars that are happening right here in this country. The fact is that we live in a country today where there are concentration camps called Indian reservations, where a group of people, nobody even speaks about them unless they're in the room. Uh, we're talking about a country where half of Mexico was stolen in, me in recent memory. I'm talking about Texas, California, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, stolen at gunpoint. And the people who come across that artificial border that they created are considered illegal immigrants and sometimes themselves stuffed into prisons with special police organizations just to deal with them. I'm talking about a peace, organ peace movements that couldn't deal with the fact that since 1998, seven million Africans have been killed in Congo alone. Right. Why is there no discussion about peace and war when it comes to that question? Right. The French are right now in Mali, occupying Mali, occupying Central African Republic. What is the situation with Haiti today that we don't see a peace movement or anti-war movement talking about that? So we said that a peace movement, a real struggle against war, against oppression, had to deal with some of these questions that's important to African people, that's important to other peoples around the world. So we said we had to build this organization, but we also had to build it because we say it's not enough just to call for peace. That we are not some kind of bystanders in history that the wars that are occurring today are wars that are being forced upon oppressed people who are tired of a five and six hundred year social system that was born from slavery, that was born from colonialism. 
that metastasized into this thing that they are called capitalism today. It's a war that's being made at the expense of the oppressed people around the world and people are fighting back. They want to take back their resources. The world that we live in is one where 80% of the people on earth, 80%, eight out of every 10 human beings on the planet earth, 80 out of one, every 100 people in this world today are attempting to survive of less than 10 US dollars a day, where 50% of the people on earth are attempting to survive of less than $2.50 a day. And if you're in Africa, you're lucky if you get a dollar a day where people sometimes work all day just for one meal. This is the order that the people are attempting to break out from. Here you have where most of the wealth is located in Earth, Africa, 12 million square miles of nothing but wealth and richness. 12 million square miles that's been feeding Europe, feeding North America for more than 600 years. Did you know we've been engaged in struggle for 600 years? Yes. Next year will be the 600th year after Portugal first went to Africa and began kidnapping black people, a process that resulted in us being in Newark today. <laughs> Go ahead, brother. A process that resulted in Brother Abdul being dead today. A process that resulted in Mike Brown dying in Ferguson, Missouri. This is not something new. This is not something new. It's been going on for a long time. And a social system was born out of it. And I think it's really important for us to understand that we are looking at a social system that was born from slavery and colonialism. It acts the way it does because it can't act any other way. That's right. And the question that's before us is how are we going to deal with it? Because Chairman Ham was at a meeting that I attended last month. And he was absolutely correct when he said that we are fighting for these reforms. And we have to fight for these reforms. But we can't just keep fighting for reforms day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and the final analysis reform won't do it. Right. It's going to take revolution. Overturning a social system that's born of slavery and colonialism. Capitalism, imperialism has no redeeming value. You know that. So. I'm happy to be able to be here. I was in Ferguson for about two, two weeks. And I'll be going back there next month. And I was in Ferguson not just because Mike Brown was killed. Because Mike Browns are being killed all around this country every day. You know that. And I think it's important to be in this meeting to listen to families of at least two victims, two murder victims by the state. We can't have meetings where, where our organization is involved without there being family members of, of people who've been murdered by the police. That's just the way it is. You can't go any place in this country and ask people to hold up their hands who have not, and, and, they, and get a response that indicates that they have not, or their families have not been victimized by police terror or the prison system. That's just the way it is if you're black and if you're living in this country. So we're talking about going to Ferguson not just because Mike Brown was killed, but we went into Ferguson because of the sustained resistance that came in the wake of killing Mike Brown. It was, it was a resistance that made black people all around the world proud. Because right. we've seen it before. We've seen the murders day in and day out. But when those young people stood up in Ferguson and fought tooth and nail, fought against all of the 
heavy armament that they brought in there. That was the thrilling thing. That was the thing that let us know that something was afoot. Something new is afoot in this country today. We say that Ferguson, Ferguson was first blood in the mass consciousness being re-emerging in our communities in this country today. And you have to be there to get a sense of what I'm talking about, or perhaps not, because Ferguson resonated everywhere. After Ferguson, we saw demonstrations against police violence, police terror happening everywhere. And the significance of Ferguson, in part, was the sustained struggle forced the government to reveal itself in a way that only we in our communities knew about before. And so now we see tanks in the streets. And they have just discovered that in this country, there are tanks put in the streets of black communities. Now we see this heavy militarized police force and everybody now is talking about the militarized police department as if it's something that just occurred, but we've seen it before. We didn't just see it, just, not just recently, we've seen tanks in the streets in Newark before. Going back years, we've seen the 82nd Airborne in the streets in Detroit before. So this is not anything new. What's new is the lie that they've created to justify. And so now what they're saying is that they have this situation, and Ferguson pushed it to the surface. They have this situation where they are selling or giving surplus weapons from the military, from the Pentagon. They have surplus weapons that they are distributing to police departments around the country. I just saw in the paper this morning in St. Petersburg, Florida, where the school system now is handing out M16s, right? The school system handing out M16s to cops on the campuses, right? Wow. Where did they get them from? They said they couldn't afford to buy them initially, so the Pentagon, with their surplus weapons, sold them to them for $50 each. Do you know that's not surplus? What is surplus? What is, sur what is surplus reality? Surplus is that which is extra above and beyond what you need. You can't have surplus year after year after year after year. That's no surplus. That's the way they padded the Pentagon budget. It is a part of the Pentagon budget to distribute these weapons to control black people and colonize people inside this country. That's what you're looking at. They call it surplus, but it's standard gear. And even, this even after Obama said, when after Ferguson, that he's going to investigate and see, and see if the so-called surplus weapons were being used appropriately. And then I look up and see that the, in Pinellas County, St. Petersburg, Florida, they're distributing M16s to the school police. Can you imagine that, Brother Ham? This is in Florida, Pinellas County, Florida. M16s to the school police. And they say, well, we need them just in case there's a school shooter. But what good will M16s do if there is a school shooter, even if that were a legitimate argument they were making? What good would, a, a, would an army that's, that's armed with M16s have done in Columbine? Or anything like that. You don't need an army. You don't need an assault team for that. That is for our folk. And to maintain colonial control of our people. That's what's happening. Brothers and sisters, these are very serious times that we're living in. I'm talking about Mike Brown. We're talking about Abdul. We're talking about the brother and grandson of the person who was talking about here, I'm talking about Tavon, who is shot eight times. Uh, that's in uh, Orlando, Florida now, but it's more than that. It's an incredibly significant moment in history. Yeah. Well, if you look around, you see the U.S. playing war games with Russia in Ukraine. Do you, do you see what, what you're looking at? the threats that they are making to Ukraine, where they want to put NATO bases all around Russia. They want to turn the whole area into an armed camp uh, with most incredible kinds of weapons to surround and control Russia because they don't want the competition from Russia when you see most of the so-called West 
in a state of serious kind of decline. They're playing war games and challenging China in the Asian Pacific basis where jets, military jets, are constantly in conflict with each other, playing games with each other. This is happening right now. They, there's a potential for nu nuclear conflagration even as you and I are having these, these discussions here. It's a serious situation. It is a situation that is born of a world economy, a political economy. The one that won't allow us to have jobs today, the, the economy that we are talking about is, a, is a, an, a, a, an economy that is inherently unjust and unequal. It is an economy that was born through slavery. How does, how does this world capitalist system get started in the first place? I know, you know they're using, they're using drone missiles to kill people in Pakistan and Afghanistan, in various places in Africa. They're talking about deploying them on the borders with Mexico and what have you to maintain a social system that exists today. Why? Why do they have to do that? Why is it that you look up and you see it necessary for them to, to be attacking and killing and maiming people? And I'm talking about maiming and killing people in Afghanistan. They, they are concerned because two white guys or three white guys got beheaded in Iraq and Syria as if that's the worst possible thing that could happen where, where Saudi Arabia, which they support, which is in their camp, which they use in order to create, to send soldiers into uh, these other countries, they have done something like 131 public beheadings this year. And so you got three people, three white guys who got killed, and now they're talking about that's enough to begin to send more military forces into Iraq, to start bombing in Syria where they wanted to get rid of a government in the first place. This is what they're saying, but guess what? The white guys who got killed, that they are talking about bombing about, they did not get killed in Ferguson, Missouri. They were not in Missouri when they got killed. They were in the Middle East on somebody else's land trying to do something to somebody else that they did not want done to them. We live in a world where the, where the world economy, nobody's talking about bombing about Mike Brown. In fact, when it comes to Mike Brown, they don't even want, to, the prosecutor doesn't even want to take responsibility for an indictment. Wow. He won't indict. He says, I wash my hands, put it to the grand jury. The grand jury is supposed to come to some kind of determination in October. The assumption being that by then, the struggle would have worn off, people would have gone to sleep, and they could let the cop go who killed Mike Brown. Brothers and sisters, these are serious times. And people want their freedom and they want their resources. And it is a world economy that was born of slavery. It wasn't like one day Jesus said, let's create capitalism for white people uh, in, in Manchester, in England. It wasn't like one day uh, something like this occurred. The fact is that capitalism was born from slavery. It came from, listen to me, it's some of the most astute, some of the most astute philosophers and economists, most, most important historical philosophers and economy have said quite explicitly that the slave trade came about but the slave trade was important for the development of capitalism, said. Right. Said, where does capitalism come from? Slave. It comes from turning Africa, transforming Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins. That's where it came from. It came from the, from the British fighting a war against China in 1841 and 42 to force China to take drugs. They call it trade. They said they wanted to trade with China because they wanted, China had tea, and they wanted tea from China, and they had opium that they wanted China to take for the tea, and China said, we don't want opium. So this is what they call trade. 
They kicked off what they called the Opium War, 1841, 1842, and turned China into a nation of junkies. Turns forced China to do drugs. And you act like you don't believe that they put crack cane in your community. Hell, that's how it got started. Off drugs. They held, the French held Vietnam for more than a hundred years with the most important colonial resources coming from Vietnam being drugs. They had legal opium dens all over Vietnam. This is how capitalism got started. And then it consolidated itself. It built military and political institutions to protect itself. This country, this land that we stand on, this land, the traditional custodians of this land, the indigenous people, this is a part of the primitive accumulation, the start of capital that started capitalism in the first place. You hear what I'm saying? So you got a whole economy that functions like that. That's why 80% of the people on earth are trying to survive off less than $10 a day. They built, they built institutions. They built armies. They built NATO. They built first the League of Nations and then the, Uni the United Nations in order to protect this relationship. And so people everywhere are trying to take back their resources. People in Venezuela said that oil should go to feed our own people. And people in, in other parts of the world are trying to take the resources so that their children can have a life. Here you are in this country, and I've seen them in, in, up in California, where people go live in, the, in caves. Mexicans live in caves, but come down out of the caves to work picking vegetables and growing fruits and what have you that end up in supermarkets here where they can't afford to have them for themselves and they are treated like so-called illegal aliens. This is, this is what constitutes the political economy of this country and the world. And people are trying to break free from it. And it's causing economic crisis everywhere. That's why Greece is in trouble. That's why Portugal is in trouble. That's why France is in trouble. France is in so much trouble that it egged the U.S. on in terms of the attack on Libya that overthrew that government and lynched the president in the streets. France egged, on, egged them on in terms of Syria. Now you see the murder and mayhem that's happening there. How many hundreds of thousands of people have died in Iraq? And then, of course, our people in this country. So we say that I'm here to win your support for the November 1st and 2nd March, rally and march on the White House. And we want to do it under the slogan, peace. So everybody likes to talk about peace, but they don't like to talk about social justice. Right. And peace without social justice is surrender. So we're going under the theme, peace through revolution. And we're going under the theme peace through revolution not because we think the revolution is going to happen tomorrow or not because we think all the conditions are right for revolution, but because we think it's necessary to start drawing some lines in the sand between us and those forces who want to have peace on the plantation. People who talk about peace but they will not struggle for social justice. People who talk about peace. How many peacenickers have you seen? How many people from the peace movement have you seen laying down in front of police cars before they get into our communities creating mayhem? We think that, that it's a, going to be an important event. And already, we've begun to get a lot of endorsements and support from different kinds of organizations, because we want everybody to march behind the red, black, and green. We want Palestinians, white people, Mexicans, Everybody, and we want them to come, raising the kinds of issues that are important to them. We have to begin to challenge and change and transform this concept of war and peace so that it includes what happens to us, so that it includes the bodies that they leave laying on the ground in a hundred and some odd degree pavement and weather 
in Ferguson, Missouri for four and a half hours. The family, the treatment of this family is not even unusual. It happens in every case. Sometimes you might get a police report. Sometimes you might find out who killed them. Often you don't. That's what happened in Ferguson. That's the situation we got in Orlando. Uh, it's totally disrespectful, the contempt with which they treat our people. And I think that Ferguson, again, is first blood. I think that this is the time for us now. Uh, and November 1st and 2nd uh, is going to be an important event. And we hope that you'll join us with this rally and this march. And we hope that you think enough of it to try and actually mobilize uh, to get as many people as you can to come and join us in this mobilization. Uh, I know that Chairman Ham is supposed to be one of the speakers there. Uh, uh, Charles Barron, uh, out of uh, New York, the former uh, city council person who by that time, or uh, right shortly afterwards, be the state assemblyman. Uh, Charles Barron is one of the speakers. Uh, uh, Matula from Dead Prayers uh, is going to be one of the forces. The UNAC, the United, uh, uh, anti, the United National uh, Anti-War uh, Coalition will be there. International Action Center, of course, Glenn Ford uh, will be there. Uh, uh, Kali Okunu uh, from out of Mississippi, who uh, was with Chokeway and part of the uh, Malcolm X Grassroots and, um, and uh, uh, NAPO uh, will be there. And so uh, I'm hoping that, that you will come out. And I'd like to, I just want to say in the first one we did, where I got beat up here before getting there, <laughs> Uh, them sisters jumped dead in my chest. I ain't never been assaulted like that by sisters before in my life. But I appreciate it because this is an really extraordinarily democratic process that you have here. And uh, Chairman Ham, uh, I just want to say that uh, I've been in the movement now for a long time. Um, next month I'll be 73 years old and most of my life I've been involved in the movement. But. Uh, and I've been in the movement in terms of high tides of resistance and struggle. And then we've gone, you know, like to this valley where it's hard to get anybody to do anything or come out. But I've never been uh, affiliated with a grassroots movement uh, that can stand up in any way at all to what I see with People's Organization for Progress. And uh, I say that it's the most incredible grassroots movement organization that, uh, that you can find anywhere, anywhere, anywhere. Uh, and the democratic, the democracy here is just mind boggling. So I really appreciate being here, but the sisters jumped on me. <laughs> but they did it democratically. <laughs> for, for, for daring to talk about marching on the White House with with that, uh, that uh, silver-tongued, uh, <laughs> uh, pimp-limping, <laughs> left-hand jump-shooting <laughs> uh, Barack Hussein Obama. The sisters got, got dead in my chest. But uh, I'm hoping, but the thing that was really striking after all of that, when we standing up there uh, looking to see who was going to come, all, no, suddenly, out of nowhere, those yellow T-shirts popped up. And, and actually made the day uh, for that event. And so I'm hoping that we see these yellow t-shirts again on November 1st. On November 2nd, we want to have a teach-in because there are a lot of critical issues that people need to, to understand and, and come to terms with. Uh, a lot of stuff that's happening in the world that confuses a lot, of, a lot of people. I mean, this new aggression that's happening in Syria, the, ex the, the, the expanded bombings in Iraq and things like that. The, this whole thing with, uh, with, the, with Russia uh, around Ukraine and, and what's happening uh, with this contest uh, with, uh, with China. What's happening in Africa with AFRICOM? What does that mean? And Ebola. What is this Ebola thing all about? You understand? And uh, I mean, these are the critical questions because Ebola is a part of the warfare that's being made against our people. It is a part of the warfare that's being made against our people. How in the hell can you have a situation like that? And then Cuba sent a hundred and some odd doctors 
And then Obama sent 3,000 soldiers. Did you see that? Cuba sent a hundred and some odd doctors to help with Ebola. And Obama, after, of course, consolidating AFRICOM, a whole African command center to control Africa, right? He sends 3,000 soldiers there. That's serious stuff. We need to understand all these things that's happening to us. And I'm hoping that you'll come out and I'm hoping that you'll play a role and participate uh, uh, in both the, the rally, the march, and the teaching that's going to be happening on the second. I want to express uh, my deepest, most profound appreciation for your allowing me to share uh, this agenda with you and for your being here uh, so that there's a place that I can come. This sister, uh, what's your name again, Queen sister? Mother. Queen Mother. Um, I, I was here, 11, when I was 11 years old, I came to New Jersey. My grandmother, my grandmother's sister, was in this place in New Jersey, and I can't remember the name of it. And I thought it was something like Rochelle, a new Rochelle, yeah. right? Yeah. And then I was just talking to this sister, <laughs> Queen Mother, and she mentioned to me, Roselle. That's, right. That's where my grandmama's sister and my family is located, and thanks for coming, being, your being here gives me an opportunity to track them down. So uh, I want to thank you again for allowing me to be here, and I hope to see you on November 1st and November 2nd, Washington, D.C. Uh, we're going to march uh, for peace through revolution. Uhuru. Uhuru. On September 24th uh, at uh, 12 o'clock, I'll be doing a book reading at Military Park at the, uh, something that's sponsored by the Harlem Book Fair. That'll be noon on the 24th. Thank you very much. Give him a big hand, come on. Give, give Chairman Yesha Teller a big hand, come on now. Dedicated his life to revolution. You looking at a real live, dyed in the wool revolutionary who, when his community was being surrounded by helicopters, fired on those helicopters. <laughs> That's right, in Black Hawk Town, that's right. I would like to uh, entertain a motion uh, that the People's Organization for Progress endorse the November 1st um, march and rally that is being called by, uh, is it Impedum or APS? Black is back. Oh, it's Black is back. It's your, being your, called. Your coalition, <laughs> the one where you were at one point kind of sore. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. Um, November says there a motion is moved by Ingrid, is seconded by Nat Williams. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? All abstain? Motion carried. Is um, Johnny Stevens here? Johnny Stevens is not here. Okay. Uh, what, what is it? Next week. Next week? And what is he going to speak on? Eighth of October. Okay. Hello. Are you there? Yeah. All right. Hold on. All right. So Johnny is not here. Um, as you know, last week when we went over uh, Chairman Yeshtel, we always go over dates to remember at the beginning of each month, and. I believe Monday was, when was the 15th? Monday the 15th was the anniversary of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church where four girls was killed and one of those that was killed was Addie Mae Collins. And we had a program with a survivor of the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, Sarah Collins, her sister. And I have Sarah Collins on the phone right now. Say, say hello, give her a hand. Hello. Say a few words to the people, uh, Ms. Collins, Rudolph. Yeah, I was 
Well, Ms. Rudolph, we just wanted to say how much we um, appreciated when your visit here. And uh, yesterday was a sad anniversary, and we wanted you to know that we stand in solidarity with you and your husband, George. And I don't know if everybody heard what she said, but one of the things that she said was, first and foremost, that she was terribly injured uh, in the bombing. Uh, her sister was killed. She survived, but she lost her sight in both eyes. She eventually recovered sight in one eye, but remains blind in the other eye. But she is still with us today and is reminding us about that historical event and, and our struggle. But the other thing she said just now was that uh, in the grave where her sister was buried that they had exhumed the grave and the body is not her sister's body that's in that grave it's not Addie Mae Collins and her and her husband George are involved in a struggle with the city to f try to find the remains of Addie Mae Collins can you believe that 50 years later after that terrible event but Tell her, tell Miss Collins Rudolph, we love you. We love you. We love you, sister, and we want you to stay. Go ahead. And we love you, and we want. All right. I will call you soon. Take care. Bye bye. Power to the people. See, we can just call up historical figures. Just call them up.